Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the bridge. It's a beautiful day outside, and we have some exciting ways in which God is going to encourage us and speak to us today through today's worship service. Um, the other thing, though, that does need to be mentioned and shared at the beginning of the service today, and uh, their faith has encouraged all of us, uh, but we, we know John Davis and his wife Kim and Andy and Dre uh, very well, and if you're on our email prayer uh, or email update list, you know that, that John's dad has been terminally ill, and I got a text at about 9.30 this morning that John's dad, who was a pastor and had great faith in Christ, is home with the Lord. Uh, he passed away about two o'clock and I have a text that I'd like to read as we start today from John because it, it shows uh, an aspect of what it means to place our faith in Christ even through death and he said thanks for your prayers brother I got to be next to dad until his last breath he went home to heaven about 2 a.m. this morning and I am glad he is with the Lord and without pain. We as believers have a faith that endures beyond the grave. And to be absent from the body, Scripture says, is to be present with the Lord. And uh, John's dad's faith is now his sight. We get to sing about that, and we get to be reminded of that. But it is also appropriate that our prayers continue to be with the family. So before we do our scripture and call to worship today, we're all going to join together in prayer for them. So let's pray together. Father, we ask at this time and these moments that your peace and your presence may continue to give comfort and strength to the Davis family. We rejoice, Lord, in your faith that endures beyond the grave and the faith that you gave to John's dad the fact that he is with you. We pray that that truth may continue to bring comfort to the entire Davis family and that you would give us wisdom to know how we can encourage them as they continue, Lord, to walk uh, alongside of us and with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our call to worship is going to uh, be from Psalm 122, verse 1. It's a very simple verse. It says, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And uh, I don't want to put her on the spot, but I was just really encouraged by the way she walked in. But, uh, but Dottie uh, walked into the church with a smile on her face, just rejoicing in the fact that she's in the house of the Lord. And... Uh, and it was kind of one of those things where once I saw her and once she was sharing all that the Lord was doing for her, I'm like, man, I want to bottle that up. And I need to drink that every once in a while. And there's probably some of you that need to bottle that up and drink that every once in a while. The cool thing is, God, through the Holy Spirit, he gives us that joy to rejoice in his presence. And where two or three are gathered in his name, he is with us. Let's stand and sing. Praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God. Praise Thee, O God, for the Spirit of life, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, Thine glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise. To the Lamb that was slain, who 
has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace. Who has brought us and sought us and guided our way. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Psalm 68, 20, 19 and 20 says, Praise be to the Lord, to our God, our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves. From the sovereign Lord comes escape from death, even death. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on the Savior. Fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to fall on the Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering. As your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the 
world will see that, and the world will see that our God saves, our God saves. There is hope in your Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one that has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need.
in grace alone. What beautiful Amen. words and a blessing that song is, especially to me. Now, at this time, we are exceptionally blessed to have wonderful children's church workers to take your kids' birth through fifth grade back to class so that they can have a lesson that aligns with the message this morning, but said at a different level for just their age. So while they're going out, let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask for his guidance. Dear Lord, thank you so very much for the children that we have here at the bridge and for the workers that we have going back to teach them today. Now, Lord, please open their little ears so that they might hear that message and open their little hearts, even the smallest of heart, that they might accept you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul in uh, Romans 8 says, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, we've got to realize how wretched we are first before we can allow His grace to pour on, down on us. And He's got plenty. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to Oh, 
on holy ground. We are standing in His presence on holy ground. Amen. Let's go with the Lord in prayer. Almighty Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you today, knowing that you are in complete control, Lord. No matter our failures, you're always there, and you have a plan for us, Lord, and we can't thank you enough for that, for loving us so much that you want to work in each and every one of us. Lord, I just uh, pray that you open our hearts today, speak to us, so we may hear your words. We ask that you fill Stephen, hide him behind your cross, Lord, and speak boldly through him. And Lord, may we uh, just leave here today with renewed hearts of joy because of you, so we may go out and do your will that you have planned for each and every one of us, even though we might not know what it is, but have faith that you are going to do good things for your will and your will only. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus. And we can't thank you enough for the love that he gives us, that he bore our sins and bled for us. Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So we have been studying the life of Moses. And last week, we covered 80 years of Moses' life. If you were not here, it was a long sermon, 80 years. Today, we're going to cover one day in the life of Moses. And we're going to discover that this is a very ordinary day could be much like today. But that through the midst of this very ordinary day, Moses meets with God, who is extraordinary, and everything about his life changes. So last night I'm thinking about this encounter that Moses has with God and it's Moses in the burning bush. So we're probably somewhat familiar a little bit with this account. And it it dawned on me that scripture says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that if that's true and scripture is true, then could it be possible that today on this somewhat ordinary day, God has a desire for you to encounter him today in such a way that will totally transform your life, that will change your direction, that will move you away from sin and and self and death and destruction and, and to God which is walking his path for you, which doesn't come without heartache and hardship, but it does come with the one whose presence with you is greater than he who is in the world. So then I begin to think about, well, what are those life-changing experiences that I've had in, in my life? And the first one that immediately popped into my head And if you're a parent, you can identify with this probably. Um, And I talk about them a lot. And you all know I have twins and I'm proud of them. And they're in first grade this year. And I have a son and a daughter. And my daughter happened to be born eight minutes before my son. And it was the weirdest eight minutes of my life because I love my wife. And now I get to see my daughter for the first time. Yet I know my son is on the way a few minutes later. And if I could have like made myself have three eyes at that point and, and had one on my wife and one on my daughter and one on my son, I, I would have sought to do that. And it 
there are these moments where a few seconds can feel like a few hours because time just kind of stops. The word that was kind of almost overused a few years ago was kind of the word surreal. This is, this is a surreal moment, but there are those moments that are. And at that moment, as my eyes locked with the eyes of my daughter, I realized this is a game changer for me. Because everything that I've thought up until this point, now I get to see is, is, is does, it, it, does it really ring true as I enter what it means to be a dad? Now, some of you are like, I'm not a parent, so good, Stephen, glad you had that moment. I don't know what you're talking about. That wasn't the only time. There are other moments throughout our lives, and I think I began experiencing them in grade school, okay? And we've got everybody fifth grade over there. So if you're in here, you're sixth grade and up, you have had moments and experiences like that in your life. Could be a relationship with a friend or a family member, or it's my hope that you've had at least one such experience with Almighty God. That there's this moment that comes where the, the still small voice, the peace that passes all understanding, the hope that is enduring beyond all things comes to comfort and strengthen and empower you in such ways that you know I won't be the same because of this. So we're going to read this passage. We're just going to do the first 15 verses of Exodus chapter 3, but I'm going to go ahead and show you all my cards even before I read this passage. It's my prayer that, that you may take this moment and say, God, I want to hear from you today in such a way that I won't be the same when I walk out those doors. And uh, I think God loves to hear those prayers. And uh, it's a lot deeper than, well, I won't be the same because I ate two donuts before church, so I've got more calories. It's, it's more than that. It's deep. It's rich. So, Exodus chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Here's the account. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Is my mic off? Is this better? I'm just going to take that off because sometimes that's uncomfortable. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> now I'm kind of afraid to say anything. <laughs> All right. When the Lord saw, we'll pick up with verse 4 again. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry 
because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is your name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that your words from your word may penetrate our hearts to the depth of our being and that we may realize that though this is Moses' encounter with the burning bush, that we too encounter you and that as we encounter you, that we may be changed and transformed. For your glory and according to your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Moses had been keeping sheep for 40 years. Remember, this is Moses last week, who was in the basket, and Pharaoh's daughter had compassion on him, and then he was raised in the best schools in all of Egypt. And then when he was 40 years old, he had compassion on God's people and took it out on an Egyptian slave master, murdered him, and then the next day his own people turn on him and he flees. And God keeps him in the wilderness taking care of sheep for 40 years. I'm not yet 40. So in my mind, now I'm close enough to 40 now to where I do not believe 40 is anywhere near old. (laughs) But I'm not yet 40. 40 years of taking care of sheep. Far away from his people. Far away from his land. Or is it? Were the Israelites in the right land at that time? Not really. And the crazy thing about it is, what I learned from this, and and the first truth of today's message, is that God's timing is not your timing. And it's not my timing. So there are things that I'm confident that you and I wish that we would experience, wish that we would see, wish that would change and we often begin to think why in the world is this not going faster than i want it to go but god doesn't get into a hurry and god is always working and in the midst of your waiting god is at work it's another interesting thing that happens in verse one it said that he was keeping the flock of his father-in-law And it says, he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness. 
This is Moses leading sheep. But what Moses doesn't realize is Moses is leading sheep, but God is leading Moses. And Moses is moving closer and closer to a mountain named Horeb that is called the mountain of God. And I don't know, I asked my wife last night, so I'm speculating here, but it's possible that this is Moses' salvation experience. That this is the moment in time when God appears to Moses in such a way that it transforms everything about Moses. Now, I understand that some of you can say, wait a second, Stephen, don't you remember last week? Last week we heard that Moses had a God-fearing mother who put him in a basket. And then Moses was taken care of by his mom and his mom told him all these stories. And that's all true. But it is possible, and I believe it's true of some of you out in this church today, for you to know a lot about God, but not really know God. And it is possible that Moses could have had an identification with his people, and he didn't like it because of the blood connection, and he could have been very patriotic for Israel, and that could have moved him to kill the Egyptian, to stand up for his people, but it may not have necessarily meant that he knew the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. At the bridge, our mission statement is connecting people to God's indelible grace. And our hope is that whenever people hear that word indelible, and I don't mean to insult anybody, but I didn't know what indelible meant for a really long time. So if you know what indelible means already, then you're a lot smarter than me. Indelible is a mark that will never, ever go away. And we believe that Scripture teaches that an encounter that is experiential with Almighty God will touch our hearts in such a way that we will never, ever be the same. And Moses didn't have, it seems, that encounter when he was 40. But he's having it now. And God is drawing him to this mountain. And the reason why I'm bringing this all up is because Scripture seems to indicate that it is God's drawing that brings us into such an encounter. We don't all of a sudden wake up one day and say, I think I need God in my life. Now, circumstances and situations take place that God is in control of, by which His Spirit leads us closer and closer to him. And at the 40-year mark of Moses being a shepherd at 80 years old, Moses is now being led to the mountain of God. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. So in our community group on Thursday night, we're walking through this passage of Scripture, and somebody makes the comment, it would have been so easy to be Moses. I mean, at that moment, you have a bush, and you've probably seen bushes on fire before, but this one doesn't burn up. If God would just give me a sign like that, then I would believe. You know what I think sometimes I'm tempted to do? If God shows me a burning bush that doesn't burn up, I'm going to look and say, oh, well, that was for Moses. What's for me? I want something different. Or, well, that was kind of weird, and I can probably rationalize that away. 
or God, gee, you just got me on a bad day. I am so busy today. Can you come back tomorrow? I'll be more available tomorrow. What's Moses say? In his mind, in verse 4, he thinks to himself, I'll turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Verse 4, the very first few words, is very important. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him. This begs me to ask myself the question, and I invite you to do the same. How many times is it that God is showing me signs, but he has not yet called my name? And he has made it very clear that this sign is from him, but he wants to see what my reaction is to his initial sign will be before he calls my name. Moses turns to get closer to see what's going on. I can think of any number of moments and times in my life where I've gotten a glimpse of, I think God's doing something here. And then when I look more closely, I go deeper in my relationship with God. But when I am busy, when I'm not on that page, I don't hear all that I believe God wants me to hear. Now, some of you could say, well, Moses, I mean, he was pretty available. 80 years old, sheep, in the middle of nowhere, his life isn't my life. That's true, but his call isn't your call. And it doesn't mean that God is not giving you signs, even right now, as God's word is being communicated. And God is giving you an invitation to come and see, to come and look, to get a little bit closer. And what is Moses' experience then? Moses' experience is God calling his name. And not only does God call it once, God calls it twice. Moses, Moses. God cares deeply about names. God loves to call us by our name. And the crazy thing is that as God calls Moses, 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 Moses says, here I am. And we don't really know all of why. And we talked about this in community group too. I'm mentioning community group, that's kind of a subtle hint. Now it's a direct hint. Community groups are really good. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. We talk about this stuff before the sermon in those. And we we're kind of wondering, how does God react when, God, when Moses says, here am I? And then we started thinking, how did Moses say, here am I? Moses could have said, here I am. Moses could have said, here, 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 here I am. Moses could have said, I am. Yes, you're right. You got the right person. But why is this bush talking? We, we don't know how he responds. But we do know there's a message in that, here I am. And that message communicates, I am present. I am here. I am locked in. I am available. If you describe the way in which you walk through life, there's an expression that sometimes is communicated, well, I'm just kind of going through the motions. That's not God's will for you. And that's not God's will for me, to just walk through life, going through the motions. God's desire is for us to encounter him multiple times a day that makes us available and attentive to all that God is doing around us. I've used this illustration before, and, and just it's one of the ways that it really drives home to me 
um, we, we shared that, you know, uh, a group of us said, you know, when we go grocery shopping, we should always remember we're not just shopping for groceries. We're looking for people. And some of you are like, what, what are you talking about? I'm talking about that God is always at work and God is always at work with the people that he's created in his image. And there is no such thing as a coincidental, I have just happened to run into so-and-so at the grocery store. And when you run into somebody at the grocery store, God might be calling and inviting you to give that person a smile or an encouraging word or to let them know, hey, you matter, and I'm going to acknowledge your presence. Are we available and attentive to all that stuff that's going on around us? After Moses says, here I am, God says something very interesting in verse 5. Do not come near. James 4, 8 gives us a promise Draw near to God, and he will come near to you. And some people like to think, well, does the Bible, does it contradict itself? This almost sounds like it does. James 4, 8 says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Here, Moses comes near to God, and God says, don't go any further. Stay put. What's happening? God is holy. We are not. God never sins. We do. There is separation between God and man. But the interesting thing is that the next instruction that God gives to Moses is to take off your sandals. Where you're standing is holy ground. When I teach this story at Evangelical in the grade school, I actually let all of the kindergartners and first graders take off their shoes. Bad move. A lot of them don't know how to put their shoes back on. And one teacher came in when I was teaching and they said something like, why have you taken off your shoes when Mr. Helfrich is teaching? And I had to kind of say, uh, Mr. Helfrich actually told them they could. We're doing Moses in the burning bush right now. That was a little bit of a rabbit trail. Why does God tell Moses to take off his sandals? Historically, taking off your shoes indicates a sign of respect because you're in the presence of one greater than yourself. In addition to that, in that culture, slaves always were shoeless. Think about why we put on our shoes. We put on our shoes so that our feet and our legs will carry us places, right? So that we can carry out our business for the day. So that we can fulfill our agenda. Could it be that God is telling Moses at this moment, Moses, for the first 80 years of your life, you put on your sandals and you went wherever you wanted to go. But now you're going to take off your sandals. And when you put them back on, you're going to go where I tell you to go. What's at work here? This is a lordship thing. Okay, there's tons of people who get these nice, good, warm, fuzzy feelings, myself included, when I think about how Jesus has saved us. If you don't have those warm, fuzzy feelings, you should check your spiritual pulse. That should create a reaction when you think about how Jesus has saved us when we didn't deserve it. But Jesus is not just our Savior. Jesus is called the Lord of Lords. When Jesus is Lord, that means that He is the one that calls the shots. My wife talked to our kids this past yesterday about sovereign, and she was telling me about it. And I said, how do you explain sovereign to first graders? And she smiled and said, he's the boss. He's in control. He 
calls the shots. First graders often get that better than 40-year-olds. Why? I think because first graders already have some authority figures, right? They've got parents, they've got teachers, they've got grandparents. You get to be 40, you're out of the house. You know, you seek to be respectful to your parents, but they don't really call the shots for your life the same way that they did when you were six. And you kind of like the idea of, I don't want anybody calling my shots. But God is telling Moses here, I'm going to call the shots, Moses. And you're going to take off your sandals. And you're going to trust me. And you're going to go on a wild ride. And I'm going to use you as an instrument to free my people. But that means you can't go your way. You have to go my way. Take off your sandals. The other thing that's interesting is, as Daria said in Polish culture, not so much true in America, that when you walk into a home and you want to stay for a long time, you take off your shoes. If you keep your shoes on, you're communicating to that person that you visit in Poland, this is going to be a short visit. Could that be a true as well here? Could God be saying two things with the same statement? I think he does that all the time. God's not only saying, I'm going to call the shots for you, Moses. He's also saying, Moses, get comfortable. We're going to spend a lot of time together. You're going to get to know me well. So the sandals go off. It's holy ground. I'm going to touch one more time on this idea of lordship. When we have a radical encounter with God, God becomes our all in all in a way that we say, okay, God, I don't know where you want me to go. I don't know what you want me to do. All I know is that my answer before you even request it is yes, whatever you want me to do. When you really are connected to God, it becomes your joy to do this. It does not become a duty. It becomes a delight. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, my daughter has discovered that shopping is fun. <laughs> She's a first grader. It's going to be interesting. And we went out to eat this past Tuesday, and Daria said, hey, they're out of long sleeve pajamas. My thought was, They've got long sleeve t-shirts, don't they? <laughs> They're good. She said, no, they need long sleeve pajamas. I said, okay. And she said, well, how about you go to Target and get long sleeve pajamas? I'm not a shopper. I kind of look at her and go, what? And she says, yeah, why don't, why don't you do that? I said, all right. So I look at Sophie. Say, Sophie, want to go shopping with me? Oh, yes, absolutely. And Vinny, we're going to look for pajamas for you that have animals, because we know you're into animals. All right, so we, we go to Target. And the selection at Target, maybe because it's not season yet, wasn't that great, but it was like a buy one long sleeve pajama package, get one free, free in quotes right here, because the price tag that I saw on buy one, I thought could be buy two. But it was the perfect pajamas for Sophie, and she let me know. She said, this is exactly what I was looking for, Daddy. And, and what's that thing? What's that thing right there? And I had to read it. I said, well, Sophie, this says it's a sleeping mask. You put that over your eyes, and you can, it'll be darker. You'll sleep better. And she said, perfect. I've had a really hard time sleeping lately. <laughs> this is great. I said, you've got to be kidding me. So then we go, and she's holding these pajamas, and we go to look for, for Benny, and there's Superman and Batman and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Minions from Despicable Me Too. All stuff that lots of kids are into, but my son's not into so much. He wants animals. So Sophie's looking and says, well, is that all there is? Because I really, I promised Benny that I would give him pajamas with animals. So wow, she really loves her brother, and she gets it. But I don't know what to do. So after 
phone calls with Daria. Uh, she said, all right, well, hold off. I'll get Benny pajamas somewhere else. And really, she doesn't probably need those pajamas. I said, wait, those pajamas, she's in heaven with those pajamas. And then she said, okay, then get those pajamas and, and we're good. So I went back and for a moment I said, Sophie, are you sure you want these pajamas? And I don't know, because some of you girls can like do this on command. The little lip starts to quiver. <laughs> and, and, and it just sort of has this melting effect. And, and I'm like, wow. And I said, Sophie, you really want this? And she said, yes, Daddy, I want it, I want it, I want this so bad. This is going to be so great. She gives me a hug. And what happened through that hug turned my, oh, goodness, these pajamas, this much money, into I can't wait to make her happy. And it moved from it doesn't matter how much this is, it doesn't matter how impractical a sleeping mask is, which she's actually worn every night since Tuesday night. <laughs> she is getting her money's worth of this mask. But there is this sense in which it transformed my emotions and my thoughts. So I'm walking through this sermon last night and, and I think like, Man, God, like, I don't really have an illustration for tomorrow. And then he brings to mind my shopping experience with Sophie on Tuesday. Now, we're going to discover through the rest of today and also next week, Moses' heart isn't yet where Sophie got my heart on motivating me to be excited about buying those pajamas for her. But God's going to get it there. So much so that Moses longs for opportunity just to be in God's presence. That Moses stands up one day and says, God, just show me your glory. I just want to be with you. There is no one better than you that I would rather be with. I thought, that's, that's salvation. That's the fruit of a vibrant relationship with God where you just call out and say God I want you I need you and then I thought and what kind of delight does that bring to our father's face when that happens and I think probably most of us have been there where we say okay this Bible yes we're supposed to read this Bible so okay I'll read this Bible and then we read the Bible in the morning and we chalk, check, mark that off our list and say, okay, I had my quiet time. I'm good now. Or we say, well, I, I think the Bible talks about how we should probably give of our time and our talents and our treasure. So I, I, I want to do the right thing. So I'll go ahead and do these things. Now it is better to do the right thing for the wrong reason than not to do the right thing at all. That sounds kind of weird, right? But let me tell you what's best and what God's will is. To walk with Him because He has so transformed your heart that you can't wait to obey Him. And that is the fruit of salvation. That's the fruit and the evidence of grace. And that's when hearts are transformed. That's when it becomes an experiential adventure. And that's authentic salvation. That's the real deal. And if you're looking out today and you're saying, man, I don't know that I've ever experienced that kind of excitement with God. then God's inviting you to experience that today. He wants to so capture your heart that that becomes your reality. All right, final thing. God tells Moses... Look at my people. And he shares about the people. Okay? My people are hurting. My people are in pain. My people are in slavery. Why is God doing this? Because God wants Moses' heart to mirror God's heart. You notice this possessive pronoun that God uses? It doesn't say a people. God says my people. 
are in slavery. My people are in bondage. And God is telling Moses about this because God wants Moses to be moved and to be moved to action to do something about it. And then in verse 10, God tells Moses that sort of like this is where the hammer hits the ground, okay? Come, I will send you to Pharaoh. I think at this point, Moses goes, say what? Me? There's somebody behind me? Because me? Or no, you're, you, there's no way you can be right about this. Not me. And then God says, or Moses says, who, who am I? I can't do this. You know what's crazy that God does with this excuse? God does not answer who Moses is. God reminds Moses who God is. He says, Moses, get your eyes off yourself and put them on me. Don't worry about who you are. I am and I will be with you. And that will be enough. I need to believe that today. I don't always believe that. I think it often depends on me, myself, and I. And me, myself, and I, we don't get very far. But God with me. Waters part. And miracles happen. And God is saying, get your eyes off yourself, Moses. This actually has very little to do with you and a ton to do with me. I am going to redeem my people, and I'm going to redeem my people, not for your glory, Moses, for my glory. And you get to be a participant in this story. It's an invitation to get involved in what God's about to do. Moses asks another question. Okay, God, hypothetical. Let's say I go. They're going to ask me, what's your name? Who spoke to you? How? What am I going to tell them, God? And God says, you tell them, I am sent you. You tell them, I am. I am who I am. I am. If I were Moses, I don't think I would have been this disrespectful to say it out loud, but I would have been tempted to think, thank you, God, so much for clearing that up on your name. I am. What does I am mean? Moses gets a glimpse of a story that we know the completion to. You see, who appeared to Moses in that burning bush was a specific part of the Godhead. It is the part of the Godhead who always comes down and comes near to come and lift us up out of our slimy pit and put us on the rock. So several years later, a man named Jesus of Nazareth walks the earth and is asked by Jews who he is. And Jesus responds by saying, before Moses was, I am. And in that moment, Jesus says to the Jews, and they understood it. They weren't happy about it. They wanted to stone him. I am the God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. I am the one who always was, always is, and always will be. And not only am I always was, always is, and always will be, I always will be for my people. I will hear their cries, and I will always come and deliver them with an outstretched arm and a mighty hand. I will save my own. So in Matthew 16, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? 
And Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit's revelation, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus looks at Peter and says, you are right, and you are Peter. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, only after Peter correctly identifies who Jesus is, does Jesus look at Peter and say, now that you know who I am, I can tell you who you are. This bunch of baloney about trying to go find yourself is for the birds, guys. You cannot find yourself, but God finds you. And once you realize who God is, then God will tell you who you are. But quit trying to find yourself apart from him. It doesn't work. You'll just spin your tires. So God tell, Jesus tells Peter, you are. And then he goes on and says, and upon this rock, the rock of the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, I will build my church. This church isn't mine. This church isn't yours. This church is Jesus Christ. And he makes a promise that he is going to build it. And that promise is so strong that he says, and the gates of hell themselves will never overcome the church that I build. What's God saying? What's Jesus saying? He's saying, I win. I win. I deliver and free my people and I bring them into eternity with me. But truly gripping and truly grasping that truth puts a change in you and a change in me that requires us to take off our symbolic sandals and say, not my way, not my will, but yours be done. You put these shoes on me, God, and I will go where you tell me to go for your glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you because you are constantly at work and you are constantly doing more than we could ever ask or imagine. And I ask, Lord, that you would teach us and show us by your truth that we need continual encounters with you by which we look back and say we will never be the same. Thank you that you spoke to Moses and thank you that you speak to us and thank you for the promise that you will build your church. The gates of hell will never overcome it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The reason why the gates of hell will never overcome the church that Jesus builds is because Jesus is alive. He's not dead. He's risen from the dead. And in his state of being alive and risen, he sits before the Father and he prays for his people. And he prays that we may become more and more awakened to the reality that he is on his throne, that he has our good and his glory in mind, and that he wins. It's my prayer, my hope, that we may come awake to that reality and that truth. So our final song is a song called Come Awake. We've sang it before, but I want to invite all of us to sing this final song, not just as a song, but a prayer that God would do this thing in our hearts to cause us to come awake, that the church may come awake to all of the promises and the divine plan that God has for it. And then as we walk out those doors today, that we may share that hope and that joy with people who don't yet know it. Please stand and let's sing together. Inside the light of inward change.
chain that fix our eyes upon the cross and run to him who show great love and bled for us freely you bled for us Christ is risen from the dead cling over death by death come away come away come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead we are one with him again Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Beneath the weight of all our sin, you bow to none but heaven's will. No scheme of hell, no scoffer's crown, no burden. has risen from the dead and we're called to come awake to that reality and that truth before we go we heard a little bit about what God was doing in Moses's life at the burning bush but there's something else going on too back in Egypt there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in slavery crying out to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob for mercy, for peace, for strength, for hope, for purpose in their lives. May we be those who do not take the grace of God for granted. If you know Jesus, you have had a burning bush encounter with the living God. But you have neighbors, and you have co-workers, and you have family members, and you have friends that don't often even know who to cry out to, but they're crying out, and they're acting out, and they're doing all of these things that they hope will bring them pleasure and peace but they're broken wells, they're broken buckets, they leak, they don't satisfy. So if you have had that burning bush encounter with God Almighty, hear Exodus 3.10 today, where God says, come now, I am sending you to them. And 
trust in he who is in you. Get your eyes off yourself. And yes, you'll stutter around when you talk to them. And you'll think you're totally missed it. But God, God promises to speak through us and work through us and move through us as we just let him put our shoes on and go where he leads us. And we will be able to be eyewitnesses of the great deliverer, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, delivering more and more people from death into life. Receive this benediction. And now, to you, God, who gives us burning bush experiences, may we take off our sandals, give them to you, and let you lead us as we go out and watch you deliver and free your people. Empower us with your Holy Spirit to do your will so that you are glorified. Amen. You'd be seated for just one moment. I kind of tricked you, right? Really quickly. Um, we are about to have a, a uh, this was a luncheon that was necessary to sign up for, but if you want to learn more about the bridge, uh, we're going to have a luncheon here in just a little bit. This is what has happened. And I don't know how we want to work this, but there's five spots <laughs> still for this luncheon. So if you're like, oh, I didn't sign up, but I would really love to, to eat lunch and learn a little bit more about what God's doing through the life of the bridge, we have five spots. If there's like 10 people out there, we'll settle it by rock, paper, scissors. Um, <laughs> And I'm being somewhat tongue in cheek. If you're like, oh, I really would love to go, but like today's a bad day. We have another luncheon scheduled on October 12th and there's a sign up at the table and there's plenty of room. Uh, we're keeping it 30 and under, but we, um, we're not gonna quite have 30. We're looking at like seven to 10 today and we've got five open spots if you're interested in that. And then the final thing I wanna share with you guys, community groups. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. If you want information about those, uh, come talk to, to one of us. Uh, it is, and I'm just, I said this before, but I think it bears repeating, um, your spiritual growth will be stunted if you're not reading the word with other believers. Like you just won't grow the way God wants you to grow. So do it for yourself, but don't just do it for yourself. Do it because I'm convinced that if your spiritual growth is stunted, but you're a part of the bridge, then also the, the spiritual growth of our church is stunted if you're not digging in to the word with other people in some form or fashion. And uh, I have yet to meet people that don't find that time uh, beneficial and educational and encouraging. So if you want info about that, that could be a way that God calls you today to take off your sandals and let him lead you. All right, just a thought. We need to apply his word, not just listen to it. Have a wonderful day, everybody.